Hi everyone, and welcome back to College Minds YouTube channel. Before we get started with this video, remember to subscribe below to make sure you don't miss any of our top college application tips or test prep strategies. And if you find this particular video helpful, go ahead and click the like button below to share it with your friends on social media. Let's get started with today's topic. Today we are talking about a new subject for the College Vine YouTube channel, but it is a topic that we've already covered extensively on the College Vine blog and with thousands of our student clients themselves. That's the ACT test, and today we're going to talk about how to prepare for the math section of your ACT. Here at College Vine, we know there are three critical components to test prep. The first is familiarization with the test, the second is content knowledge, and the third is test strategy. In this video, we'll outline the details for each as they pertain to the math section of the ACT. So first, let's get to know the test. Before you take any standardized test, one of the most important things you can do is familiarize yourself with how the test will go. You should know not only the content, but also the test's format and its directions. You don't want to waste valuable time on test day reading and interpreting instructions for the first time. The math section of the ACT is the second section on the exam. It follows the English section and precedes a 10 minute break. For some students, the first challenge of the math section is shifting gears from humanities-based thinking from the English section back into computational thinking and math. If this is the case for you, we recommend practicing some mind-clearing strategies during your practice tests that you can employ on the real test day if they seem to work for you. Try taking several deep meditative breaths while the test proctor reads the math section instructions. As you do, try to roll your shoulders or arch and relax your back. Repeatedly practicing these simple meditative relaxation tricks during practice tests will help to cue a mental signal for test day that you need to be able to shift your gears from English into math. Once you've cleared your mind of all the thinking that you just did on the English section, hopefully you're ready to get started on the math section. The math section of the ACT consists of 60 questions that you'll answer over 60 minutes. The questions are not arranged by subject area or topic, but they are generally ordered by level of difficulty. This means that questions that are commonly found the easiest are going to be at the beginning of the test and that the questions will progress to become more difficult or complex as you move on. But don't worry if you get to a question at the beginning that completely stumps you and you feel like even the easy questions are too difficult. While the questions are generally arranged according to difficulty, each specific student finds some variation that results in your own strengths. It's not uncommon for even well-prepared students to find a few of the earlier questions difficult or a few of the later questions much easier. Just do your best on each question and move on if you find an early question that does seem really tricky for you. Approved calculators are allowed on the ACT, but test designers note that all questions can technically be solved without a calculator. Be sure to review the full ACT calculator policy. It's worth noting that the popular TI-89 graphing calculator is not permitted. In fact, use of a TI-89 is the most common reason that students are dismissed from the ACT test for prohibited calculator use. You should also be aware that unlike on the SAT, there are no references provided on the ACT. This means that you will need to know all necessary common math formulas on your own, out of your own head on test day. These generally include things like Y equals MX plus B, the area formula, the quadratic formula, and others, but none of them are too complex. We'll talk more about that in our strategy section later in the video. Step two is to study the content. Once you know the format of the test, you also need to just learn the skills that are tested. The math ACT covers a lot of content knowledge, and it's one of the test sections best suited for direct rote studying of specific curriculum. The content on the math ACT breaks down as follows. Pre-algebra is 20 to 25%. Elementary algebra is 15 to 20%. Intermediate algebra is another 15 to 20%. Coordinate geometry, 15 to 20% as well. Plane geometry is 20 to 25%. And trigonometry is 5 to 10%. More specifically, in terms of algebra content, the test will contain approximately 14 pre-algebra questions based on math terminology like integers and prime numbers, basic number theory, including rules of zero and order of operations, and the manipulation of fractions and decimals. Another 9 to 10 elementary algebra questions, those are topics like inequalities, linear equations, ratios, percentages, and averages. 9 to 10 intermediate algebra questions based on exponents, roots, simultaneous equations, and quadratic equations. 14 plane geometry questions. These will be based on content including angles, lengths of lines, triangles, quadrilaterals, circles, perimeter, area, and volume. 9 to 10 coordinate geometry questions covering topics like slope, distance, parallel and perpendicular lines, points of intersection, and graphing and four to five trigonometry questions covering basic sine, cosine, and tangent functions, trig identities, and graphing. 
So are you looking to start studying somewhere? Well, the content listed above is a great outline for a study sheet. Going through that content piece by piece will help to organize your studying and guide you as you prepare for the math section of the ACT. Now, the last section of our video is about learning your strategies. Let's go through them one by one. A first strategy is to move more quickly at the beginning to conserve time for the harder questions at the end. The ACT is a notoriously fast paced test, so pacing is a really critical strategy to master. It can be easy to think of the pace of the test as about one minute per question because there are 60 questions and 60 minutes, but that's actually not the best pacing reference. Because of the test's design, which organizes generally easier questions at the beginning and more difficult questions toward the end, as I mentioned earlier, you should aim to reach the midway point of the test much earlier than that one minute per question pace would predict. So instead of answering the first 30 or 40 questions in 30 or 40 minutes, try to answer those in 20 to 30 minutes. That leaves you about 30 minutes for the last 20 questions because those last 20 questions are generally more difficult or complex and will probably take you more time. One solid strategy to accomplish this is to skip over questions that initially seem difficult for you. If you find that you've spent already 10 seconds thinking about a question and still have no idea where to even begin, fill in your best guess, circle the question number, and just move on to the next question. If you do have time left at the end of the section, you can come back and revisit those questions you skipped. If you run out of time, at least you did fill in a guess, and at worst, you have a 25% chance of getting that answer correct just based on guessing. Strategy number two is to write down at least part of your mental and calculator calculations. There will undoubtedly be some questions that you immediately know how to solve quickly, either in your head or with the use of your calculator. On these simpler questions, you're probably tempted to just fill in the answer as quickly as possible and move on to a more complicated question. While time is definitely of the essence and your instincts aren't completely wrong, you should at least write down part of your mental or calculator calculations. If you arrive at an answer that doesn't seem quite right or that isn't one of the answer options, which is always your nightmare on a standardized test, you'll want to know where exactly you went wrong in your calculations. Going back to resolve the question from scratch will cost you more time. However, if you've written down part of your calculations, at least you'll have a better idea of where you started, where you ended, and where in the middle you went wrong. Maybe you just pressed a wrong button on your calculator. Maybe you added in your head instead of multiplying. Whatever the case may be, hopefully you've notated enough of the equations that you don't have to start again from the very beginning of this question to find and check that answer. Strategy number three is to break down word problems. For even the most savvy math students, word problems can present a real hurdle. Sometimes there's irrelevant information in the word problem. Sometimes the actual question they're getting at isn't that obvious. But in any case, you should have a strategy for breaking down word problems as soon as you encounter them in the standardized test. Most often, that strategy includes underlining figures that indicate numerical value, crossing out numbers or phrases that are irrelevant, and circling words that indicate function. For example, words like per, each and every usually indicate a rate, so you'll likely need to use multiplication or division to arrive at your answer. Sometimes it can even help to draw a quick sketch of the scenario to help you envision the question. Whatever the case may be, just make sure that you have a clear idea of what the question is actually asking before you begin plugging in numbers and solving an equation. Otherwise, you could get stuck with calculations that are ultimately completely irrelevant to the question being asked and you would have wasted some precious moments on the test. Strategy number four is to know when to use your calculator and when to leave it alone. Although an approved calculator is allowed on the entire ACT, it's not required on any of it. That is to say the entire ACT can be completed without the use of a calculator. For that reason, it's best to think of your calculator as a helpful tool, but not a crutch. If during your practice test, you find yourself using it for every question or even for most of the questions, particularly at the beginning of the test when the questions are not meant to be particularly difficult, you should evaluate why exactly you're leaning on your calculator so much. Always try to use mental math first. For example, when you finally reduced an equation down to 3x plus 6 equals 21, you should be able to solve for x without using your calculator for that simple math. You may think you're doing yourself a favor by double checking everything, but really you're just eating out precious time and sometimes you're even putting yourself at risk of making careless errors by trusting your calculator more than you trust your own brain. As you practice for the math ACT, try to gauge your use of the calculator. If you think you're using it for more problems than you're meant to, more problems than you're not using it for, try to identify why that is. Take a practice test and note each question on which you use a calculator. Then when you finish the section, look at which type of questions those calculator questions were. It could reveal some gaps in your content knowledge that are easily remedied by more studying. It's always better in the long term to fill in those gaps before the test 
rather than use your calculator unnecessarily on actual test day. Strategy number five is to back solve from answer choices. This strategy is particularly helpful on algebra questions. On a test with multiple choice answers like the ACT, it's fairly simple to work backwards when trying to solve for an unknown variable. All you need to do is take each answer choice, plug it into the equation, and see if it actually calculates out. To maximize your efficiency, start with a value that seems the most reasonable to you and go from there. If that value doesn't work out in the equation, move on to the remaining answer choice that seems the next most probable. Even if you have really no idea how to solve for the variable using your algebra skills, back solving will allow you to arrive at the correct answer in a fairly efficient time frame. Strategy number six, our last strategy, is to just become your own reference sheet. As we mentioned earlier, there is no reference sheet that's provided for the math section of the ACT. For this reason, you need to arrive at the test day having already memorized the formulas that you'll most likely need to apply as you work through the test. Formulas that you should know ahead of time include the following. The slope-intercept formula, the quadratic formula, area of triangles, the Pythagorean theorem, special types of triangles that may be 30, 60, 90, isosceles, equilateral, etc., area of a circle, circumference, area of a sector, area of a rectangle, area of a parallelogram, area of a trapezoid, trigonometry functions, sine, cosine, tangent. You can study all of those formulas by creating flashcards, making your own account on Quizlet, or taking turns quizzing your friends. You can enlist the help of a friend or family member once you have the list written out. For some students, the simple act of writing each equation in its entirety can be an important learning tool in creating that mental reference sheet. Finally, be sure to check out the vast ACT resources that are available on the CollegeVine blog. We'll link to a few of the most helpful ones in the comments below this video to get you started on your studying. For more general guidance on applying to college, remember to visit us online at app.collegevine.com. That's it for today's video. Thank you for visiting us here at the College Vine YouTube channel, and good luck if you're applying to college or taking the ACT this season.